Uh, hi, I am happy to see so many people today in this in this hall. That gives me a slightly higher chance of boring to death some of you. <laughs> so, uh, to the, as as Boris put it so promptly, I've been doing mainly low-level performance optimizations and fighting feisty compilers at Chaos for the past five or so years. And it's been a great pleasure for me to do that. I'm that kind of person. Um, so the topic for today's lecture is, uh, coincidentally, about low-level stuff, just as well. And it's, uh, it's a sort of a rhetorical question that goes like, do instruction set architectures still matter? Now, it is in a question form because uh, there, there has been some kind of uh, in, in, in the lecture space, there has been this notion that instruction set architectures have per perhaps run out of their importance. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter, the instruction set architecture, as long as you can parallelize, as long as you have backward compatibility, the instruction set architectures are not important. I'll try to show you whether that is the case and leave the conclusion to your own. Uh, first thing first, what's an instruction set architecture? An instruction set architecture, or an ISA, for short, is a runtime programming interface uh, of a von Neumann machine. How many of you know what a von Neumann machine is? I'm, I'm glad that so many people know that fact. So basically, most of the computers around us today, in this age and day, are von Neumann machines. So what we're going to talk about here is related very much about the compu computers that you use in your daily lives. Uh, if we decided to divide programming into two major domains, the domain of software and the domain of hardware, again, von Neumann hardware, then the ISA would be the contact plane between the two domains. So here, on that very simplistic diagram at the bottom, you see that uh, if we start with ideas at the very high end of the spectrum of programming, abstract ideas, we go down with uh, high-level programming languages on the APIs, low-level languages and APIs. Then before we get to the actual hardware, we get through the machine language, the ISA. Well, and here, here comes another very meta question. Do languages matter in principle? Why, why do we care about languages in the first place? Well, intuitively, I think that most of us could reason that languages and their APIs, of course, are directly related to the efficiency of mapping high-level abstractions to low-level execution apparatus. Execution apparatus, in this case, is a fancy way to say computer. Uh, so such an efficiency usually has two major aspects. Uh, the programming efficiency and the execution efficiency. The, the programming efficiency has to do with the effort that we as programmers have to put in order to get some ab abstract idea to execute on some piece of silicon. And the execution efficiency has to do with the how, how good the silicon is at running our idea. So again, uh, about, about programming efficiency, uh, it wouldn't surprise anybody if I said that programming efficiency has been on the rise ever since computers appeared. So there's been this huge hardware abstraction level stack that has been growing and growing over the years, a huge spectrum of general purpose programming languages and their respective APIs. And by APIs, I usually mean libraries and frameworks. Uh, some very clever domain-specific languages. We just saw one presented by our stand here uh, in the previous talk. I was really, really fascinated by his talk. Uh, then there is an entire universe of domain-specific extensions to those languages in the form of libraries and framework. Now, what's, what's specific about li libraries and framework is that they're considerably highly volatile compared to the languages. Languages change much slower than libraries and framework change. And the other thing typical about libraries and frameworks is that they're usually written by highly, uh, highly knowledgeable people, experts in the field. I mean, that's the reason that such APIs and frameworks become uh, industry-wide in the first place. So it wouldn't be, again, a stretch to say that programming efficiency has been on the rise ever since programming became a thing. And today, it's, it's, it's easier to write, I mean, to translate abstract ideas into running code on a piece of silicon than it has ever been in human history. 
Moreover, we can expect that tomorrow this will improve even further. Well, how about execution efficiency of the hardware? Is perhaps the situation likewise? Uh, not really. So until earlier this millennium, uh, there were two forces that were really pushing performance forward. Again, on the software side, we had the effort of all the software developers working on language toolchains. And by toolchains, I don't mean just compilers and linkers. I mean compilers, linkers, debuggers, static and dynamic analyzers, profilers. So all that helps us as programmers to extract optimal performance after our code. Uh, so that, that was on the software side. On the hardware side, there was something that was known as the NARD scaling. The NARD scaling was an empirical law devised in the middle of the 70s that basically I will not de de delve into details about the NARD scaling. I would just mention that uh, what came out of it as a final benefit to the end user and to developers was that the NARD scaling promised that electronic transistors as used in computers would roughly double their electrical, electrical performance characteristics every roughly two years. So every two years, we would have twice better at electrical efficiency transistors. And that actually translated to the end user in exponential rise of clocks, of CPU clocks. Now, that was very fine and dandy until one day, well, one day figuratively, Somewhere in the 2005, through the span of 2007 or 9, perhaps, dinar scaling grinded to a halt. There was no dinar scaling at play anymore. Something had happened in, uh, in, in, in lithography processes, in fabrication processes of chips, so dinar scaling stopped working. So what happens when two forces are working together to pull a big boulder of weight, and one of the forces dies off, the other force gets all the weight to pull. So, uh, all the pressure for delivering further advancements in performance fell on language developers and toolchain developers and API developers. Of course, that situation could not last for indefinitely long, and that pressure translated on application developers eventually. So what were back then the options, and what are still the options of going forward? Well, the very apparent question, answer to this question is, get smart at using parallelism. Luckily, there are various levels of parallelism, uh, starting with instruction level parallelism, if there is such available for us, uh, data level parallelism, memory level parallelism, as well as task level parallelism. Now, today, I will not be talking about those kinds of parallelism. I will be talking mainly about something else. So is there really nothing else that we could do about improving sequential programming? Are we, are we at the dead end? Is it, is it the end of the road? Uh, usually, when somebody gets to a dead end, the normal behavior in such a situation is to backtrack. Backtrack a bit and see whether they didn't get into some local extremum of their search function. Uh, so, when we backtrack, we usually go to a last known good position. And in, terms of, in, in the case of uh, CPU architectures, that could be pretty much the start of our journey. And at the start of our journey in CPU architectures, there is something Sorry, there is something which is generally referred to or known as the fundamental law of performance of sequential computing. This is the iron law of computing. Uh, it's, 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 it's called iron law for a very good reason. It, it's absolutely imperative. The iron law basically states that uh, the task duration equals the instruction count, the active instruction count that a task takes to execute, multiplied by the clocks per instruction, multiplied by the individual clock duration. Or put in plain English, that means that the time our task takes to execute equals the dynamic instruction count multiplied by the average duration of each individual instruction. Uh, now here we should put a remark that at clocks per instruction less than one, or its reciprocal instructions per clock greater than one, we are already taking advantage of a certain level of parallelism, which is known as the instruction level parallelism. Uh, again, we could, we could actually repurpose the iron law of performance for energy performance just as well. We could just as well say that the 
energy performance of a given task executed on a given apparatus equals the number of dynamic instructions multiplied by the average energy consumption of our instruction for that architecture. Now, that is true only when uh, the, such, a, such, such a processor has distinctively uh, different states between active, actively executing instructions and idling or passive state. Now, luckily for us, all processors have been lately moving in that direction. They all have power states, power levels, where the CPU would consume one amount of energy executing instructions and then consume much less energy when idling. And here, another remark is that this uh, repurposing of the ion law of performance is actually true regardless of where we do uniprocessing or multiprocessing because instructions just accumulate. We don't care where they arrive from. So seeking to improve the performance of von Neumann machines, again, focusing on the ion law of performance term by term. Let's see what the options are before us. Well, we said that the clock dura duration, uh, it didn't exactly flatline. I've put a very strong word here. It didn't exactly flatline, but its exponential growth died somewhere back in 2005. Uh, the worst news is, though, that when we do multiprocessing, our instruction clock drops. Why? Because it takes more energy to run n processors at the same clock than it takes to run one processor at the same clock. And that energy has to be dissipated, etc. So when we do multiprocessing, we inevitably g get a drop in clock compared to uniprocessing. The other term, the, the next term in the iron law, the clock per instruction, is a function of instruction level parallelism. Now, advancements in instruction level parallelism usually come at exponential difficulties. What, what, what does that mean? That means that we know pretty well how to turn a one instruction per clock processor into a two instructions per clock processor. It's, it's a well-known uh, uh, fact. Now, it's slightly more dif difficult to get a two instruction processor into a two instructions per clock, per clock processor. And it's much, much more difficult to go beyond that. Uh, so that in increases in that term of the law come at exponential difficulty. And the last thing that remains here in the instruction count. Is there a way that we could improve instruction counts in our code? Well, here we could say that we could imp improve instruction counts by making the ISAs, the instruction set architectures, to be better fit for our purposes. What does that better fit mean? Uh, this is basically another way to say that they're useful. Now, if, uh, when we say that something is useful, though, we could say that a storm is useful for breaking stuff. But it, it wasn't designed for that way, right? We just accidentally found a use for it. When we say that something is fit for a purpose, we actually imply that somebody deliberately made it useful for that. And the difference between a stone that we used to break stuff with and a hammer that was designed to break stuff with is we could say that one is useful and the other is fit for the purpose. So can we make our instruction set architectures fit for, 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 for general programming purpose? Now, that's a bit of a cliffhanger here, because what does fit for general purpose programming mean? I mean, general purpose programming, the, the very idea of general purpose programming is that it's a wide range of applications. So how do we actually make something specialized for a wide range of applications? Is that, isn't that an oxymoron in the first place? Well, let's see. Let's start with Turing completeness. Well, Turing completeness is something that gives us a very, very good fundamental for us to start and developing instruction set architectures. It guarantees some, certain mathematical properties of our computers. Now, we can say that while every general purpose ISA today has been Turing designed, deliberately designed as Turing complete, none of them is really Turing compatible. And by Turing compatible, I mean that they don't really try to process code the way Turing machines were designed. Why? Because Turing machines were just a mathematical abstraction. The Entscheidung's problem automata devised by Alan Turing were made to prove certain properties of, ma of a mathematical problem, and nobody really meant to run code on them back then. Ergo, none of the current architectures are Turing compatible. It makes no sense. Even though Turing architectures are self-sufficient to be general purpose machines. Actually, the very notion of what comprises general purpose computing evolves with time. And as a result, operations, opera uh, addressing modes, data types, and entire paradigms become less relevant 
with time, and other such instructions addressing modes and data types become more relevant as we move on forward, because our understanding of general-purpose computing evolves. As a result, an ISA that was a state-of-the-art for general-purpose computing some 40 years ago is a very unlikely candidate to be a state-of-the-art general-purpose computing ISA today. Uh, so what happens to ISAs? What, what, what comprises the lifespan of an ISA? Well, usually ISAs, here I will, I will make a, a difference between two major ways of ISA evolution. One of them I will call minor revisions, and the other I would call major revisions. Minor revisions usually happen several times per decade for most active ISAs, and they usually add domain-specific functionality to an ISA. Sometimes they fix shortcomings, but mandatorily, such minor revisions always keep backward compatibility in, in the ISA. Now, the other kind of uh, evolution of established ISAs is when major overhauls happen to an ISA. That means that uh, the ISA either was running out of usefulness at that stage in time, or a new role was acquired for that ISA. Somebody started using that ISA for something else that it wasn't originally used for. Uh, and at such a, such a major revision, always the following dilemma appears before ISA architects. Shall we keep backward compatibility, or shall we drop it and try to produce the best possible ISA going forward? Actually, in history, we have examples of decision, decision going either ways. Uh, two examples, uh, situations when a major revision of an ISA actually effectively preserved backward compatibility is the transition of Intel's instruction architecture, uh, Intel Architecture 32, to the 64-bit version of this architecture. There, the binary compatibility was largely preserved. Another such typical example in in the world would be the transition from MIPS 32-bit to MIPS 64-bits, where the binary compatibility was also largely preserved. Uh, an example of the opposite, where backward compatibility was abolished, was completely dropped, is the transition from the last 32-bit ARM architecture to the first 64-bit ARM architecture. There is no backward, com backward compatibility between the two. Now, let's focus slightly on the transition of the Intel Architecture 32 onto the 64-bit version of the Intel Architecture. First, when we talk of 64-bit Intel Architecture, we have to specify that it's a particular mode of execution in the processor, and it's known usually as long mode or 64-bit uh, mode in the documentation. Now, that transition on, on, on an encoding level, on the way that the processor interprets instructions, is achieved in 64-bit uh, Intel architecture as a, usually as an extension to already existing operations. And that extension usually comes in the form of prefixes to the operation. That means extra bytes before an operation encoding. So that effectively most 64-bit operations and extra addressing modes in the 64-bit Intel architecture actually come in the form of several major prefixes. The most well-known of them is the Rex prefix that basically says, this instruction, we are going to interpret it slightly differently. Now, conversely, a very small number of instructions were actually reinterpreted in 64-bit mode from working on 32-bit data to working on 64-bit data. Uh, the AVX instruction set also originates as a prefix extension to already existing SSE 4.2 uh, instruction set. Now, the, the interesting thing about the, uh, this is the VEX instruction prefix. The interesting thing about the VEX instruction prefix is that it's a three argument instruction prefix. We'll get to that in a second. And finally, a very select few instructions were actually deprecated. That means they were removed from the, from the instruction space and their opcodes were used for something more useful. Now, when I say very few, I mean re literally six groups, six small groups of instructions were removed from the Intel instruction set of which the most notable and the, larger, the largest group of them is the uh, ASCII arithmetics and binary codec decimal arithmetics. They were just abolished. Now, somewhere in the middle of the 80s, something interesting happened in instruction set architectures. Uh, the, 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 the dichotomy of RISC versus CISC appeared. Now, RISC and CISC are two concepts that appeared with the introduction of that concept, and that concept actually appeared at the same time at two uh, academic centers at Berkeley, both at Berkeley and at Stanford. And there people came to the conclusion that the uh, five paradigms really changed the way ISIS operate. The first and most important paradigm was that 
uh, the access of CPUs to memory should be decoupled from all other possible CPU activities. This is called the load store paradigm. And all the all processors, all, especially all risk processors, implement that paradigm. Whenever there is data to be accessed from memory, there would be deliberate instructions that, do, that deal only with access to memory and nothing else. That uh, brought to the following uh, effect. Basically, since you have a small set of instructions that only access memory, whether they read or write, regardless, all the other instructions don't really have to worry about access to memory. They have to have good access to registers. The second very important paradigm that was introduced by RISC back then was the fixed instruction length. That means all the encoding of instructions had to be a fixed length, some good length for the decoder. That really reduced the complexity of the instruction decoder and fetcher, which are the uh, gatekeepers to the instruction pipeline. Uh, the third paradigm was the large increase in the size of the general purpose register file. The general purpose register file is the pro in the programming model of an ISA. These are all the registers that a program or a compiler sees when they run on this CPU. And actually, the last two paradigms were reductions. Some, some features of, 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 of architectures were reduced. What was reduced? Uh, there, were, there was a reduction in the verb set. And by verb here, I mean or arithmetic or logical operations. So RISCs, as an original idea, had fewer arithmetic, arithmetic operations. And also, there was a major reduction in the addressing mode. So the way the processor would be able to access different addresses in memory. Now, the last two were made with the purpose to simplify the pipeline even further and improve its clock characteristics. And it served its purpose fine. Again. Of course, that was a trade-off, because there was also a, dec a decreased expressiveness of the ISA. And from the point of view of the iron law of computing, that could impose a performance hit. Of course, things were carefully calculated not to, not to, not to bring to this. Uh, so with time, reduced versus complex has actually become one of the great misnomers, misnomers in computer science. So when people say reduced versus complex, they usually mean those, two, those, those last two paradigms that reduced the expressiveness of the ISA. But is the case still like this today? No, the case has changed. With the advancements in transistor accounts, risk architectures have actually regained their lost expressiveness to a large degree. So today, risk architectures have as many or even more verbs than contemporary risk architectures and they have also regained their addressing mode capabilities. On the other hand, CISC architectures have started adopting risk paradigms. So there's been this intermixing of genes between the risk and CISC paradigms. Still, in modern days, we can still make the differentiation between a risk and a CISC architecture by the following four factors. First, a risk is mandatory a load store architecture. There are no non-load store risk architectures. Uh, another thing that is very typical for risk architectures is that they use the three operand encoding. So basically, every operation has at least two input operands and one destination operand. Which, that is very typical for risk. It's not mandatory, but it's typical. Again, the fixed instruction length still remains as a requirement for risk, but today it's been uh, slightly loosened. So not just one instruction length encoding, but several few instruction length encodings are permissible in risk. And by few, I mean two or three. And the last uh, differentiator between RISC and CISC is that today, RISC architectures still have the much larger visible register file compared to CISC architectures. Now, when I said that uh, CISC architectures started, started adopting RISC DNA, uh, I mean the following. By mid-1990s, the most performant Intel CPU at that time, the Pentium Pro, actually adopted the most essential risk paradigm, the load store paradigm. But the way it adopted it, they didn't break their ISA, their backward compatibility. They implemented it on the microarchitecture level. Now, what's the difference between an architecture and a microarchitecture? An architecture is just a contract. It's a programming contract. The microarchitecture is the actual implementation of that contract in silicon. A microarchitecture has performance characteristics, an architecture, not so much. Well, at least at first glance. Uh, so what happened is that basically any instruction that a, a Pentium Pro would encounter that had 
a RAM argument in the instruction would be broken down into micro operations. Uh, that really helped the pipeline to make good use of the out of orderness of the back end of the pipeline where the actual parallelism occurs. Uh, now, 20 years later, Intel sort of stepped back on that. They reverted a bit. And starting with Intel Neclum, they started implementing a technique known as microfusion. What microfusion does is that whenever uh, an operation on the front end was broken down into such micro operations that would have to do with memory access, those operations would be fused together. They would be batched into a single, uh, you, you, you can think of as a single uh, micro operation that travels through the pipeline. Now, the whole point of this optimization was that the decoder uh, would not saturate the front end of the pipeline with so many microops, but microops would be fewer. That would alleviate the pressure on the front line. But by the time that such a fused micro operation would reach the back end, it would be again unfused, and full use of the parallelism, inherent parallelism, would be taken advantage of. Uh, the next step that happened in the right successor of the Nechlem, the Sandy Bridge, was that a micro-op cache was introduced in, in, the, in the microarchitecture. That micro-op cache was deemed the, the great solver of OX86 decoder and power issues. Ironically, entry-level X86 microarchitectures don't have a decoder cache. They, can, they, they cannot afford it. They don't have the transistor budget. Now, just to give you a, a taste of what microfusion does, on the left-hand side, you see a code that is semantically identical to the code on the right-hand side. Uh, this is inline assembly, just seen inline assembly, so I do apologize for the AT&T syntax that seems many people are not familiar with. Uh, but at least you can copy and paste these snippets in the GC compiler and it will compile. So what we do in the code snippet? We increment eight locations in memory, eight byte locations in memory by one. And we, on the left-hand side, we increment them with such complex instructions that reference memory addresses. On the right-hand side, we have broken this down into more micro-op-like code. We deliberately go and read the addresses from memory into explicit registers, then we do the addition onto the registers, and then we store back the registers in, in memory. So before Nechlem, that code would perform pretty much identically on an Intel architecture. After Nechlem, the left-hand side would be faster because of microfusion, of the much higher degree of microfusion. Actually, on an Ivy Bridge, the left-hand side code is exactly 33% faster than the right-hand side code. So microfusion must be something very, very useful, right? Well, it has its drawbacks. Here on the left-hand side, send side code, sorry, we have an example of a code that goes and touches a memory address twice in a row. So here we increment the same address in memory twice. On the right-hand side co code, we, we do something that is uh, semantically identical. We load the memory address into a register, we increment the register twice, and then we store it back. Now, the left-hand side code is actually 50% slower than the right-hand side code on an Intel Ivy Bridge. So that benefit of the microfusion works only for streaming type of code. So code that touches memory addresses once and doesn't bother with them anymore. As long as we have a reuse of a memory address in a short span of code, microfusion loses. And before we actually move to the interesting part of this lecture, uh, the case studies, let me say a word on ISA type orthogonality. When we say ISA orthogonality, we usually mean that the, uh, the ISA allows the combination of all kinds of operations with all kinds of addressing modes. So the higher the, higher the, the capability to, to combine operations with addressing modes, the higher the ISA orthogonality. But we also should mention that type orthogonality is equally, if even not more, important. So imagine we had two hypothetical uh, ISAs. One of them had four verbs and two class, two categories of types, two integral types and two floating point types. Uh, so a, a very good orthogonality ISA would be one that, that for, 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 for each uh, inter integer operations, the integer operation would be available on all integer types. Likewise, with the floating point operations they would be available on all floating point types. On the right-hand side, 
we have an ISA that has no orthogonality whatsoever. Each and every operation works only on one data type and one data type only. Even though it actually makes a pretty good sense that if an operation is useful for 32-bit integers, it might be also useful for 64-bit integers. Actually, for most arithmetic operations, that is a, very, uh, that is a truism. So what are the, the, the disadvantages of architectures that are not, uh, well, typely orthogonal? The disadvantages is that each time that you write a high-level expression in a language, the compiler has to convert your data to the type that the processor knows about and, that, and do some magic with the, with the data, do some sub, sub, small subroutine to process your data in the way that you would expect it to happen. Now, this conversion back and, for, back and forth, if it's only for the conversion, means the introduction of data dependencies in your code. And data dependencies are the arch enemy of instruction level parallelism. The moment data dependencies enter your code, that moment your instruction level parallelism drops. Of course, I'm speaking of a general case. You could write specific code that exhibits very high levels of data level parallelism, even using non orthogonal instruction sets. So let's move on to the first actual uh, case study. The first case study is something that I've called Bogle loop, uh, in reference to the famous Linux kernel Bogle MIPS. A Bogle loop, in our case, is a loop that does nothing useful, and yet it has a desirable side effect. This Bogle loop of ours is actually a loop of 400,000 iterations, in this particular case, I've decided on this number, that generates a set number of branch mispredictions. What is the use of such a code? Well, we can actually test whether the performance monitoring unit of our CPU works. The performance monitoring unit should report that our code produced one quarter of all branches were mispredictions. So this is the entire use of this otherwise useful, useless code. Now, this code, you, uh, you surely notice that there is an inline assembly in the code. Regardless of this fact, this code is perfectly platform independent, platform agnostic, as long as you have a GCC compatible compiler for the platform. I'm looking at you, Microsoft. Uh, so, and let's, let's get actually down to the nitty gritty details. On the left hand side, we have an ivory, the, the, the disassembly from the G, uh, GCC5 uh, version of the code on the Intel Ivory Bridge. And on the right hand side, we have the disassembly from an uh, ARM V8 64 bit. The, the A64 bit is the name of the uh, ARM instruction set in, uh, introduced by ARM V8 for 64 bit mode. What is the first thing that, that makes an impression on you looking at this picture? Well, the left hand side code is three instructions longer than the right hand side code. Let's take a closer look at that. So, the first group of instructions in the left hand side code are three instructions that are semantically equivalent to one instruction on the ARM. And that is that, 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 that the semantics of that instruction is take a bit from this position in the register and extract, uh, and extract that many bits from that position. Now, ARM, along with many other RISC architectures, have a deliberate instruction that does that, and it does it pretty efficiently. They usually have a latency of one clock. The three instructions on the left-hand side do the same on an Intel, semantically the same thing. Let's move on. Now, we are at the group of instructions that are five instructions on the left-hand side and four instructions on the right-hand side. Again, the right-hand side, uh, so what, what do they do? They basically read a byte from memory, and they check a particular bit position in that byte, and then perform a useless jump based on that bit. The useless jump is the whole bogo loopness of, of our code. And this useless jump is the one that we expect the performance monitoring unit to actually measure whether the jump was predicted or mispredicted. Uh, so what, what can we say about this code? We can say that the code is fairly similar on both architectures. But on the left hand side, because uh, there is no an instruction on the Intel ISA that can do a comparison and branch, there, the, here, the, the, the Intel actually loses one instruction because of the comparison and branch. It also loses in another, uh, here in another instruction where it has to do an explicit move, but let's say that that's not bothering us at the moment. On the right-hand side, the ARM can actually do a test and branch instruction. That is, it tests, uh, in this particular case, it tests a bit at position zero 
where zero is a literal, and branches upon that, uh, upon upon the result of that. And the third group of instructions is the actual loop iteration closure, the the thing that counts our loops. Here, there is virtual identity between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So at the bottom of that picture, we can actually see the perf results. The, uh, the Linux perf is a very good uh, profiler, event-based profiler that I use extensively at work. Um, so here we see what happened with the, right, the left-hand side code and the right-hand side code. In case you don't actually see the nitty-gritty print, I have prepared a digest table for you. So here we have an Intel Ivy Bridge versus a Cortex-A72. Again, just by counting the instructions in our loops, we see that there are 11 static instructions in our Bogo loop on the Intel versus eight static instructions in our Bogo loop. Now, because our loop iterates 400 million times, that translates roughly to 4.4 billion instructions, dynamic instructions on the Intel versus 3.2 billion dynamic instructions on the ARM. Now, for computed instructions per clock metric, computed by perf again, of 0.72 instructions per clock on the Intel and 0.55 instructions per clock on the ARM, we get a final performance metric of dynamic clock count of 4 point, sorry, 6 point 13 billion on the Intel and 5.85 billion on the ARM. What does that mean? That means that if these two processes were running on the exact same frequency, the Intel would be 5% slower than the ARM, even though it has a 30% instructions per clock advantage over the ARM. How does that happen? It happens because the code is actually shorter and the instructions per clock difference is not that big. So here we could normally ask ourselves, could the Ivory Bridge have done any better? Is that the best that it can do? Now, for the Ivory Bridge, perhaps, but the immediate successor to Ivory Bridge, the Haswell, has a deliberate bit extraction operation. So it can do exactly as the ARM does. It can extract a bit from a position and a certain count of bits and put them in, a, in, an, in an output register. Unfortunately, no of the contemporary compilers has generated a bit extract instruction from our code, even though we have instructed it to use the full instruction set of the Haswell architecture. And by no present compiler, I mean the Intel compiler included. Uh, OK, but that, that is about the Haswell. Can we, can we actually still focus on the Ivory Bridge? Well, the Ivory Bridge by being a good Cisc ISA, actually has a version of its bit test operation. Let me go back to the bit test operation. So this operation here, it tests for a bit in the register by specifying which position, bit, which, which position we are interested in in the, in the second argument. So actually, the architecture has a version of this operation that can do this on memory operands. So we don't really have to read in the memory operand from memory the way we do in an in a explicit register, we can just test the byte in memory as it is in memory, and perhaps take good use of microfusion. Unfortunately, what happens? What happens is that no same compiler would emit that instruction, and no same compiler would emit that instruction for a very, very good reason. That instruction absolutely kills the instructions per clock metrics of the pipeline. Now, without being a, a microarchitecture architect, I would venture to guess that the version of the bit test operation that reads from memory and tests the bits from memory is an absolute nightmare for the address generation unit of the CPU pipeline. Uh, for those of you who are actually interested in microarchitectures and architectures, they should go and read the specification of that instruction in the Intel manually to realize the full gravity of the situation of that instruction. So, the next, uh, actually, the next use case. Uh, I have to make a small disclaimer. <coughs> Excuse me. The disclaimer is that uh, for the next use case, we will use a rather famous esoteric interpreted language, which goes by a feisty name. Now, in order to avoid having the video of this talk mislabeled by some undertrained neural network on YouTube, I will refrain from using the actual name of this language. I will just refer to it as BrainFrack. <laughs> so, BrainFrack is an esoteric Turing complete language which was developed in early 90s by a smart fellow, Urban Muller, 
with the sole goal of minimalism for the compiler and the interpreter. Uh, actually, it's a variation of a language that was devised much earlier for academic purposes. The language was called P2. It was invented by Corrado Bohm and was for the purpose of modeling a class of Turing machines. Ergo, brain frack is completely Turing complete. Uh, for the purpose of our tests, we are going to use a homemade brain frack interpreter and that goes under the name of Brainstorm. And it is an optimizing interpreter, which means that it does certain set of transformations on the input command stream before I actually interpreted it. Now, there are three variations of the interpreter loop of our brainstorm interpreter, and they are all made with the goal to push, to prompt the compiler in, into ever slightly optimization techniques. Uh, first, there is a baseline optimization in which we actually introduced the notion of literals to the language. You see how that is done in a second. Uh, we do that only to select brain frag commands. Now, the second thing that is related to compiler optimizations is we push the compiler to be very aggressively generating jump tables. And in the third kind of optimization, we are actually actively trying to keep our active datum that we work on at any given moment in a register for as long as possible. Now, all participants in that test were tested with all versions of the interpreter loop, and the best possible matches were taken for further analysis. First, again, uh, a, a clarification of what we changed, what we tweaked in the, in the BrainFrag semantics. We actually, here with, with the cyan highlight, we show the, the BrainFrag commands that, we have, that we've given the literal treatment, the commands to which we have introduced a literal argument encoded in the command, because BrainFrag does not have any kind of a, uh, other addressing mode rather than, uh, there's only one addressing mode in BrainFrag, and this is access the data at this data pointer. Now, we, here we introduce the actual notion of, of, immediate in, of immediates in the, in the uh, operation. Uh, here I've put a note that even though at first glance it makes sense to, act, to, to also give the immediate treatments to the uh, brain frag operations that increment the datum at the data pointer, actual tests show that this gives no performance benefit for the, for the most of the test cases. So, what are we going to run on our interpreter? There is a very famous, famous piece of code written by Eric Bosman, which is an actual Mandelblot, Mandelblot pro plotter written in BrainFrag. The source code of that program is 11 kilobytes, a very dense BrainFrag code. Uh, it's a really beautiful piece of code. The output of that code is this ASCII art. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand ASCII characters. Uh, so, I'll save you the disassembly because the assembly would be much longer, and we cannot afford to do this in this session. But I will just give you the perf stats from running this, running the best case scenarios on each of the two architectures that we are discussing today. Uh, and again, I will give you the digest table so that you don't have to stare at tiny prints. Uh, for the Intel Ivy Bridge, we have a dynamic instruction count, that is instructions that were actually executed for the plotting of that nice Mandelblot, Mandel, Mandel, Mandelblot uh, amounting to 67 point 33 billion. Again, that was happening at an instructions per clock equals, e uh, equaling 2.47 instructions per clock, and uh, eventually amounting to 27 billion clocks on the Ivy Bridge. On the ARM, we have 42.9 billion dynamic instructions. At an IPC of 1.45 instructions per clock, we end up with the dynamic clock count of 29.5 billion. Now, this time, the ARM actually loses by 8% if we take the two processes at the same clock. But it loses at 8% given a disadvantage of instructions per clock of 70% in favor of the Intel. Do you have an idea what a disadvantage of 70% in instructions per count amounts to? That's, that's comparable to the disadvantage between an in-order CPU and an out-of-order CPU or a single-issue CPU and a dual-issue CPU. This, this is a huge disadvantage in the instructions per clock. And at that huge disadvantage, the ARM is only 8% slower on this task. So let's move on to the next task. Again, the final test case for our uh, test study for today will be, again, a tight loop. Only this time, this tight loop does something useful in contrast to our first loop. So this loop actually does stream processing 
it takes an ASCII stream of, its, of uh, a stream of ASCIIs and filters certain characters out of the stream. Now, what are these characters? In this case, these are all characters that are less or equal to a space. That is ASCII code 32. Now, there is one peculiarity in this code. The peculiarity is that the trip count of our loop is actually fixed at 16. It's not because we expect all input streams to be limited to 16 characters. Sorry, limited at 16 characters. But because we have written this code with the idea to further vectorize it, and it makes things easier to vectorize when you have such nice division of work. Now, I'll save you this time all the disassembly and perf stats, but I'll give you more participants in the digest table. So we have four Intel architecture participants versus four ARM participants. We will introduce a metric here that basically says how many clocks each participant took to process a character. And you see that with the improvement of Intel microarchitectures, actually reaching finally to an AMD Zen microarchitecture, the uh, clocks per instruction gradually, sorry, the clocks per, per character, sorry, gradually drop, starting from 1.63 clocks per character and at the Zen level, it's already 1.41 clocks per character. The dynamic instruction counts in the Intel architecture part of the table are ex essentially the same when rounded to the second, digit, to the se 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 second decimal digit. Why? Because all the compilers that, that we run on those microarchitectures produced more or less identical code. So the dynamic instruction count is 4.6 billion for all of, of our tests. The instructions per count, on the other hand, Again, start with 3.52 on the Ivy Ridge and gradually rise to the astonishing 4.1 on the AMD Zen. The AMD Zen does magnificently at this test. An IPC above 4 is something pretty, pretty desirable. And the dynamic clocks, again, as a result of those instructions per clock, start from 1.32 billion for the Ivy Bridge and drop down to 1.13 billion for the Zen. What happens in the right-hand side of the table? First, I would like to apologize, because for all the Apple participants in this table, I didn't have proper profiler. So all the numbers here have been devised from the actual execution times and known clocks of the CPU. I didn't actually have the measured dynamic instruction counts, but I haven't tried to devise them. I have devised just the uh, clocks per character metrics and the dynamic clock count, which is a simple function of multiplication of clock by a time span. So let's take a look at the ARM Cortex-A72. For something that took 4.6 billion dynamic instructions on the Intel side of the architectures, it takes 3.25 billion instructions on the ARM side of the table. Now, at an IPC of 2.94 instructions per clock, which is very close to the hypothetical maximum of the ARM, except for some special cases where you could deliver five instructions per clock, but those are really exceptional cases, we actually get a dynamic clock count of a billion and one-tenth. A billion and one-tenth is 2% better than the best Intel microarchitecture. Not only it's better than the best Intel microarchitecture, but it's also, it also comes at a 40% disadvantage in instructions per clock. So I think that this is a pretty good indicator. I mean, I, I will not even be discussing the Apple participants because, as I said, I don't have the correct data set on them. But you can imagine that with these numbers going down to below 1 billion clocks for the, for the task, uh, they are performing pretty damn well. So what, what can we say about general instructions? I mean, the general importance of ISA fitness for a purpose. It actually makes a pretty damn good sense. It makes sense, it makes sense that architecture, architect, sorry, ISA architects put a very good effort into providing an instruction set architecture that is up to date with our understanding of modern general purpose programming. Because all of these test cases were randomly picked, frankly. I've, I, I was doing some uh, research on my own on the site, and I just noticed this trend in my results. So 
What can we say about the iron law of performance? Can we just produce some taxonomy that gives us a general idea of how we can improve performance, given that our, uh, one of the terms of the iron law of performance has dead-ended? And this is the clock term. Well, we actually can. If we take a graph that we put on the horizontal, the eyes of fitness, and on the vertical, the instructions per clock, then here at the origin, we have zero performance, or a performance close to zero. And here at the opposite end, of the spectrum, we have optimal performance for sequential programming. So the opposite end of the spectrum is where you want to be in terms of single, single thread performance. Now, when speaking of massively parallel architectures, though, it perhaps makes sense to slightly scale down on the instructions per, clou per, per clock, because instructions per clock just give us instruction level parallelism. In massively parallel processors, we have other more beneficial forms of parallelism that we could take advantage of. So if we can actually scale down a bit the instruction level parallelism and as a trade-off for better uh, task level parallelism, basically simpler cores that, can, that we can put more of them on a single die, we could actually end up with a net benefit. And so closing words for today. The iron law of computing performance is not going anywhere as long as we use von Neumann computers. So we have to take it into account whether we like it or not. Now, improving clocks is devilishly hard. Actually, we have pretty much reached the ceiling there. Raising instructions per clock or improving instruction level parallelism can be slightly less hard, but still is very hard. What is considerably less hard than either of those two is producing ISAs that are much smarter, much fitter to today's general purpose computing than ISAs have been in the past. So this is something that we should do. This is, otherwise, we're leaving performance on the table. And for somebody like me, that sounds terrifying. Uh, basically, we should make use of the general course of the evolution. As our understanding of general purpose programming improves, so should do the ISAs. We shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't trade off backward compatibility for, for present-day performance. And as an apology for all the torture that I've put you through, here's a nice picture of wild strawberries right from the hillsides of Tuscany, which is courtesy of our colleague Lily. Uh, in case you were wondering where you could see all those things, here are the links that you could check the code, run experiments for yourself, see the results, prove me wrong. Thank you.